Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome back to CIBC Presents Entrepreneurship 101. Um, some of you have been quite busy over the past week. We have had 29 applicants for the upstart process. Um, so, uh, we have met this morning and we're starting to divvy them out to the advisors. So what will happen sometime over the next few days, uh, maybe not by the end of this week and Monday of course is a holiday, you will get an email confirming that we have received your submission and that you indeed put your name on it so we know who it came from. Um, if you do not get that email, then contact me or the E101 number because it means it's fallen through the cracks. I really doubt that that has happened, but just in case. What we will also tell you in that email is that you will be contacted by an advisor to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting to discuss your, uh, your submission and we're leaving that in the hands, we're making the assignments to the advisors, we're leaving it to them to set the meetings up, otherwise uh, we're trying to play matchmaker for uh, 29 of you and uh, you know about eight or nine of them, which is not something I wanna get in the middle of. Okay, so that's how things are going to unfold. Um, and I think that's about all. Um, I'm delighted at the number of applicants. It's good news, bad news. We now have a lot of work, and there's some really cool things in there. I'm quite excited about uh, what's in there. So, for tonight's lecture, uh, financial planning. Uh, and this is not about your retirement and how you're going to spend all the money that you're gonna make off of your great idea. Uh, it's actually how to make that money from your idea and how to plan how to do so. Uh, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome tonight a, uh, a friend and colleague uh, who has spoken here before, Kerry Golden. Um, Kerry has had a career uh, working as an executive, as an entrepreneur, and as an investor, all in the technology areas. Um, she actually st um, started out, she has a CA, um, earned with KPMG, uh, and a business degree from the uh, Ivy School at uh, UWO. Um, she has been a pioneer, uh, initially in the field of wireless communications, and she's held finance positions with Rogers Wireless at the launch of their commercial service, um, and served in a number of roles with Bell Mobility, including the CEO of Bell Mobility Paging and the VP of Finance from, um, for Bell Mobility. Um, she has served as a CFO for a variety of public companies, uh, including Alliance Atlantis and, uh, sorry, Alliance Atlantis Communications and Loris Therapeutics, which gives, makes her a triple threat in ICT, entertainment, and life sciences, which is pretty unusual, actually. Um, she's been on the boards of a number of uh, private companies, at Santa Chem Semiconductor, Avendo Wireless, Chantry Networks, uh, Marathon Networks, Natural Convergence, Spotwave Wireless, so you see some threads there. But what I didn't know, she's been on the board of Home and Garden TV Canada and the Life Network. So, uh, I always find things, I always ask for a detailed bio from our speakers, and I always find all sorts of amazing things about my colleagues. Now, currently, Carrie currently is operating a consulting business, uh, working with um, high-tech companies, providing business and financial planning, executive team mentoring, and M&A, um, uh, merger and acquisition advisory services. So, um, she has been, and I forgot to mention this, uh, and this is where Carrie and I have worked together. Uh, she was a managing partner at Primaxis Technology Ventures, uh, an early stage uh, venture investment fund. Now, um, why I think you really should pay attention to Carrie is that over her career, she has been active in securing financings of over a billion dollars um, in equity and debt. Uh, for a uh, fairly wide number of companies. So, if you're here to learn about uh, financial planning and how to convince people to invest in your company and your plan, I can't think of anybody better than Carrie to advise you. So, over to you, Carrie.
All right. And uh, yeah, the most fun part about being on the uh, HTV and Life Network board was actually sitting on a board with Steve Podborski, who, as, you, as everyone remembers as we get ready for the Olympics, was the crazy Canuck. And he uh, was a board member who actually governed on a board like he skied, which was absolutely great for a startup type environment. So uh, learned lots from that. Today, and I think actually I might be a w one week ahead of when the uh, business planning and other tools session is gonna take place in this course this year. Um, obviously the business plan, and, and I know next week, I think Veronica is gonna walk people through, two weeks, uh, through all these items. Um, we're gonna focus today on the last one. And it's obviously very important to figure out all of the top items first before you, you put things down in numbers, but it can be a very, very iterative process. So let's, let's talk about the financial and investment requirements of your plan. Before you start though, you really need to know what you're doing with your, with your business. So whether you're a product or technology or perhaps you're a service offering, uh, particularly in the social space, you need to figure out what's your R&D budget for tech development or also in a service business, there's gonna be some startup setup costs that you need to plan for. You need to spec out your product and service. You know, what is it gonna cost you to build that product? You know, what labor costs are gonna be involved in delivering the service or building the product? And how that's gonna evolve over time because it's probably gonna cost you a lot more to build the first unit than it may cost you as you ultimately ramp up and, and get into production. Um, you also need to know market information. You know, how many of these units that you're producing are you gonna sell? Um, what's your pricing? Who's your, gonna be your sales team? You know, what's going on um, in compensation for those folks? You also need to understand too how you're actually gonna go to market. Are you gonna sell directly? Are you going to use partners to deliver your service or your, your product to the market? And what are those marketing activities you need to do? And you also need to know sort of what's the support program around all that? You know, who are the team? Do you need equipment, an office, those types of things. This is a little story that I found on a website called Trizzle last year um, about how to budget for your startup. And it has this story. Unfortunately, it's not a great story, but Sally has this new idea. The good news is Sally gets funding, which, you know, quite frankly, in today's market is really good for Sally. Um, she spends 100% of that working so hard to develop that idea that she runs out of cash and she goes bankrupt. Unfortunately, this is a very sad but frequent ending to the entrepreneurial dream. So what went wrong? She spent all of her funding on the development of the technology, product, or service, and almost no time and money selling and marketing her product to customers. Like most tech entrepreneurs, she assumed that that marketing and sales stuff is really easy. You know, it's so hard to develop a very unique code. Um, and so she figured once she had that perfect product knocked out, that everyone would just come running to buy her product. She didn't use her funding wisely to achieve milestones that you need to raise more funding. Investors are also always looking for investment prospects that already have customer traction. It may not mean that you're actually selling lots of product to them, but you have some indication that you will buy over time. Um, and that's certainly, I've got that in bold in here because we clearly live in very tough times, both for raising money, but also for doing business. And I think it's, it's doubly important then. I also think she missed a great opportunity to reduce her startup's dependency on outside financing from other people um, by securing some early sales dollars for her business. So let's talk about what your financial plan needs to include. The cash flow forecast you know, should be based on your business's execution plan. So you need to think about how much money you're gonna need and over how long a period of time and what you're gonna be able to accomplish for that. So you know, you're gonna put your sales forecast, margin, et cetera, in that income statement. You should also always consider three scenarios. So the probable scenario, the one in blue, is the one you're actually gonna present as your lead scenario. But you should also show investors and yourselves what could happen you know, if this really took off. So what if I am actually the next Skype or the next Google? You know, what's that optimistic scenario look like? Because that can get investors quite excited about your, your prospects. But you also should look at pessimistically. What could go wrong? You know, you need to, you know, help investors understand just how much cash you're going to need to be able to get to your business to profitability. And you need to also consider what changes and other factors might impact you doing that. Because you really want to plan your financing in chunks where you can be successful and, and show that you've achieved milestones to the next range of in investment or the next round. 
Cash flow is a key tool. In all startups, I'm sure those of you that are maybe running your own business today, you know that cash is king. Uh, your cash balance really needs to be monitored all the time. I'm helping a startup business today um, on a regular basis, and I log in every day just to see, you know, what our cash position is, and do, you know, obviously I have enough to cover payroll and other expenses that are coming up through my business. You need to forecast, obviously, how much total funding you think you're going to need over the life of your um, investment. Um, and, and the reason you need to do that is you need to give investors an idea of whether $500,000 over the life of 10 years of your business is what you're going to need, or are you in a different category? Maybe you need $50 million over a 10-year period because you're going to build plant and equipment and those types of things. Those are important things for everyone to know up front. Um, you also need to know what's the logical timing, who are the sources um, of that money, and you know how much you can reasonably invest yourself or raise from your network of investors before you start out. You also want to develop forecasts for time horizons that make sense. And so, you know, clearly in the short term, it's often monthly or weekly. Um, and at, for investors, you know, generally monthly is enough in the first round. And might, over time, as your business matures, it, it moves into more of a quarterly model with them. And here's a little cash flow forecast for you. And so you can see there's an opening cash position. Um, there is some equity or debt that's being invested by outside investors into this company. There are expenses, which are largely payroll driven, which is very typical of early stage companies. There are some outside expenses to suppliers, um, think like rent or other services. In this case, there is a grant coming in. Um, and so the closing cash balance is obviously $15,000, and it walks you through, obviously, the example. A couple of things you need to think about, though, once you start to get into revenue generation, is you'll see that at the bottom I say that sales for this company are $250,000 in the second year, um, but there's only $200,000 of cash receipts from customers, and that's because clearly there always will be, in most businesses, a delay from when you bill your customer and when you actually collect the cash, and you need to reflect that. Likewise, you can also make, obviously, arrangements with suppliers for some terms as well as you become a more mature business. One thing that I always suggest to early stage technology companies, particularly if you have a very complex project, is to consider staged product development. So this is actually a company that I've done some work with um, that I've obviously just blinded some of the things, but you can see here, they're developing their proof of concept, their early features, and getting into a lab trial so they can show this product to customers as early as possible in the process. This allows you to do two things. One, to get early feedback on your product and the features that the customers may be interested in, but also gets you perhaps to your first commercial shipping of product at an earlier time frame, and perhaps even some commitments earlier from customers to take product, assuming that when you do deliver the commercial version that it will meet their specs. At the same time, though, you should be looking at parallel customer mark and marketing milestones. So you should be ensuring that you are talking to customers, that you are developing a business case that says the return on the investment for the customer if they buy your product or service is X or Y, having meetings with customers and potential sales and distribution partners, demoing the product. And so these things should all be taking place on a parallel path so that the market is aware of your product at the same time as you go to launch your commercial product. Let's walk now through the income statement a little bit more detail. Your top line revenue should be derived from your market forecasts. And I think you probably have or will be having a session on our market forecasting in this course. Um, and so you should look at market forecasts, but you should also look at a bottom-up view of your customers. And uh, I'll go through an example in a minute about what I mean by that. Your pricing and cost assumptions for your product and, your, and what your business model is. I think for social entrepreneurs, if you are running a for-profit business, you might consider some sponsorship contributions early on in your business to get it off the ground. You also need to consider the pros and cons of the hockey stick. And what I mean by the hockey stick is you have a very, you know, zero level of sales coming up slowly, then all of a sudden you hit an inflection point and you look like a good old Canadian hockey stick. And the pros of the hockey stick are investors like big opportunities. And so there is some desire to see the hockey stick. The downside of it is, is there's also not too many companies who have been able to accomplish the hockey stick. And so you really have to have a viable plan about 
what's going to happen at that inflection point in order to ensure that you will actually be able to create those numbers. And so it, it's a little bit of a balancing act. And myself now, having been an investor for about 10 years and now back on the entrepreneurial side again, it's a hard balance because you know investors are going to ask you lots of questions. They may you know bump your forecast down a little bit just by their nature. They're trying to be more conservative in the current marketplace. So it's a delicate balancing act that what not set of numbers you put up. But you should put up numbers that you feel comfortable that you and your team could deliver over a reasonable period of time, particularly in the early years of the plan. From an expense perspective, you're going to develop bottom-up numbers based on your expectations. You should also try to benchmark these numbers against other companies in your industry. And if you don't have a comparable industry, uh, then you might want to say, you know, this particular product might be a good proxy for the type of business I'm trying to build. Um, you want to identify which costs are fixed. So, you know, you've signed a lease for rent and it's going to cost you $5,000 a month over X number of months versus what are variable. So if I pay a commission to a salesperson based on success, that's a good example of a variable cost. Um, you also, if you're in the social space, want, might want to consider identifying the unique costs of delivering a social impact for your investors. And the example I'm going to use there is a cafe, a cafe that um, employs people who have uh, mental disabilities. And so you may need to have you know, a coach that you're going to employ to work with those employees day to day to deliver the service in your cafe. And if you can quantify that, then it may be that the investor you're talking with you know, is willing to fund that cost without really any expectation for a financial return on that social impact, as long as you can demonstrate the social impact to them, that you are employing X number of people and you know, with them employed and working in the community that you know, their conditions are better. Um, and so that, that's something clearly unique for those double and triple line um, bottom line companies that we, we're seeing through Mars. EBITDA is a big word for earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Um, and it's really just the operating bottom line of your business. Um, and it's, it's typically used as the benchmark for exit values when you get into exits and merger and acquisition activities or for the performance of public companies. And here's your, your income statement. So you can see the top line, the sales, cost of sales, and gross margin, and we'll talk about those in a minute. R&D expenses. Clearly, in you know, Canada, we have a great program, the um, SR&ED Refundable Investment Tax Credit Program, which allows you to recover your R&D costs through your tax return process. Um, selling expenses, admin expenses, EBITDA, as we talked about. And then if you are a little bit later stage company, you will start to see things like interest, tax, et cetera getting us down to a, an absolute bottom line. So here, I, I mentioned I would talk about market share. So here's the wrong way to translate market share for an investor. So the entrepreneur states there's a really big market out there of $3 billion that someone's projecting in an analyst report, and we only need to get 1%, and we're going to have a $30 million a year business. Um, and, and unfortunately, you see this a, a reasonable number of times, or I wouldn't use the example. Um, but it's much, much better to segment your market and show your market share in relationship to a very specific small segment that your product does a really good job at meeting customer needs in. Um, investors are much happier to back that type of a proposition where you may have a 15 to 25 percent market share and be a real leader in that smaller segment um, and you're very focused on your approach as a small company than, than the latter. And, and you know what it might mean is if you actually are successful in your smaller segment, you may have something that can be rolled out to a much larger audience in that bigger market. And you're, you know, who knows? Maybe you have three hundred million dollars of of sales potential to be the the leader in that whole category. And so the better way is to look at a bottoms up sales forecast. And this is actually from a company that pitched me here at Mars, and the distribution channel for their product was doctors, and they had a, a plan to recruit doctors as follows. They were looking at 150 in year one to sell their product through trade shows, and they already had 60 of them signed up and ready to go. They forecast that at year five, they could have 2,400 doctors signed up across North America, serving 30,000 patients. The annual revenue from their product was projected to be about $1,000 per year. So they get to the $30 million demonstrating how, from the bottoms up, they can go about realistically selling this product. 
they also recognized that going in, the product cost about $100 a month or $1,200 per year. But over the period of their sales forecast, they did expect other competitors to come into the marketplace and drive the price down a little bit. So that's why they used $1,000 in their, their plan. And they also then took it one step further to say they would need six people in various regions across North America supporting sales and support reps to this doctor network. And so that is a, you know, a very solid plan, assuming that you know, I, I buy into the market opportunity and the technology that they're selling to the doctors to reach that $30 million versus just saying I'm going to take 1% of a very large market. Other things you need to consider when you're developing your sales forecasts is a mixed distribution model may result in different prices for your product. So the end user price that you sell to customers, um, you may need to consider whether there's discount practices in your industry. Oftentimes there's a list price, but no one pays it. Um, very, very common in the tech industry to have $75,000 list price, but you know no one's paying more than 60,000. And there may be a wholesale price for your distribution partners or OEM partners who are doing a lot of the selling and the customer support service for you. So you need to think about that and you may oftentimes as a startup start off selling directly um, but morph to that model over time and you, you need to make sure that your forecasts um, reflect that. Currency, um, obviously most Canadian companies sell their products in US and Europe and Asia and other markets because we have a pretty small market here at home. Um, so you need to develop pricing strategies for the individual markets you're going to work in um, and validate and state your assumptions in your plan. Um, I also think there's, we've had a lot of volatility in currency, particularly between the U.S. and Canadian rates. So um, err on the side of conservatism in your plan. So I, I even say to companies, I think it's okay to be a little bit... Um, less optimistic about the US dollar in your sales forecast and perhaps a little more bullish in your expense forecast um, and that way you know hopefully you'll, you'll get things right as things move around. Service revenues, so service businesses are very much driven by salaries and consulting rates which generally increase over time so you need to show you know how you're going to support that that value add as those costs go up each year in your business model and it, it's something you need to think about. You should always ask, is the plan realistic? And, and we can see here, you know, our friend from Dilbert, you know, clearly is relying on some pretty unusual events to happen in order for him to, to meet his plan. Cost of sales and gross margin. Um, the direct costs of producing your products, so the bill of material, labor, warehousing costs, shipping. If you have to offer a warranty on your product, you would normally put some sort of a warranty provision into your, into your budget. What's your service team's labor costs and material costs for them that they use in the business? Obviously, those costs will evolve over time. You know, production volume greatly impacts uh, unit cost. Labor costs generally increase, although they hopefully are going down as a percent of your overall total bill of material over time. Um, planning for cost reductions. So certainly in tech companies, um, you often will be engineering in lower cost versions of your product as your life cycle emerges. Um, they're obviously expressed in dollars gross margin, but often as well a percentage. Um, and you should really understand what the margin targets are for your industry and sector. I, I've just given a few examples there. Software businesses tend to be fairly high on margins, 80, 90 percent. Product companies are generally less, 45 to 60, and service companies, you know, again, just a little bit less than, uh, than uh, product companies. So if we go down now to these middle li lines of R&D, ITCs, selling and admin, let's talk about them a little bit. So R&D is, is clearly the tech entrepreneur's comfort zone. Teams are generally very comfortable forecasting these costs. Um, obviously the labor costs for the team should consider the evolution of the team over time. Um, from, you know, the beginning starting very research and product design and development oriented to, you know, more testing and QA over time. Um, you obviously must stress the sustaining work you're going to need to do on your product line, um, field support for customers, and future reductions. You know, you want to um, capture the cost of patenting your ideas, um, as well as protecting any trade secrets you have. Um, you may also need to license, you know, some products from third parties. 
And obviously, we talked a little bit about this, but tax credits, grants can certainly help you stretch that R&D budget. And there is obviously the SHRED program I talked about, which is mirrored in Ontario in the Ontario Innovation Tax Credit. Um, and there are also you know, NRC and other IRAP grant programs that are available to tech companies. Um, and they're generally on a matching basis. So you, know, you might uh, put up twenty-five dollars or $30,000 and they would match um, that amount of money for you. But selling expenses are truly what drives growth. And so this is a little graph of a company called Newbridge that I think many of us in the room um, know about, started by Terry Matthews. And you know they had the hockey stick, as you can see, in their early years. And if Sally had been Terry Matthews, she would have actually spent 50% right from the beginning of her budget on sales and marketing costs. And she only spent 33, he only spent 33% on R&D in his company, and obviously has you know, generated some pretty spectacular sales numbers, which obviously caused Alcatel to go and buy Newbridge at a very nice price for Mr. Matthews. And Newbridge isn't the only company that looks like this. Here's some other you know, companies you might be familiar with, mostly from the, the tech side, uh, but you can see Cisco, Adobe, and F5 Networks you know, I picked them because they're a little bit different in size. Obviously, Cisco very large at 36 billion, and F5 more is you know still under a billion of sales. They're spending between 53 to 60 percent of their expense dollars on sales and marketing for their product. So, what's in that with those costs? So clearly, the sales and marketing team, and it's usually a team that's very. Um, you know, spread out geographically to be near to customers. Um, and so you need to factor those into your plans. Commissions, you know, how does your plan, if you want to compensate a salesperson, how does that compensate with others in your industry in order for you to be able to recruit the best people onto your team to sell your product? You know, what marketing costs will you need? So what public relations effort, advertising, trade shows, website, lead generation, the more consumer oriented your product is, the bigger that number is going to be um, in your plan. Um, travel, living, and entertainment, you know, you want to ensure you've got a policy that you put in place so that you get coverage, but you still control costs because you will be a smart, small company. And you want to have a performance metric that helps you understand that the cost to go out and find a customer, you know, is matched with the margin on the sale. So I've seen some companies spend half a million dollars to get a customer only to find out that that customer is only going to buy $200,000 a year of product for them and it's going to take them a very, very long time to recuperate the costs of that, pursuing that customer. For admin expenses, you know, obviously you've got labor for operations, customer support, finance, HR, those types of teams and your CEO, you know, rent and those related costs, recruiting, particularly as the team ramps up, some of the recruiting costs in remote markets may become a bigger expense that you need to think about. Your professional fees, um, if you do have an outside investor, they're going to want you to have, obviously, a l reputable legal firm and audit, uh, you know, a top tier, probably, audit and tax firm. Um, you're going to have a board and investor relations costs and travel expenses and, and just the miscellaneous costs of running your business. The business case tool is something that I also think companies need to implement fairly early in their life. So you have your first product and you've got, or service, and you've, you've got a business plan for that. But the next idea, you know, if you're a typical entrepreneur, is going to come along pretty quickly. And you should have a little tool that says, you know, what should, it, would this be good for my business? And so this, this basically just shows that the cost of developing this new product out of the gate is about a million dollars, and it just you know, looks at what the incremental revenue, so how much additional revenue can I drive for my business if I make this investment, what are going to be the selling and support costs associated with that, and what's the margin over the period of time that I can expect to have back. And I think this just gets your business right out of the gate, you know, looking at the discipline of whether future development projects will contribute to your financial success for your business. The balance sheet obviously is the other statement that goes along with the cash flow statement and the income statement. And you know, the things that are typical in an early stage company's balance sheet are here. So cash, accounts receivable, and those government ITCs. You know, there may be inventory or prepaid expenses and fixed assets, um, accounts payable and liabilities, financing, you know, could be debt, equity, or a combination thereof. 
and then your retained loss or, or income. So if we talk about an asset, an asset increase means that you're using cash. So accounts receivable until you collect it um, is a use of cash on your balance sheet. And those would be obviously the amounts owing from all those different parties that I've listed there. Inventory is obviously a big concern for businesses um, that are product oriented. So you really need to develop a very detailed plan of when you need to build inventory because you clearly want to have it available for when your customers want to purchase it. But if you build it too far in advance, then you're going to be spending that precious resource cash. And so, you know, really understanding what the build plan is and managing that build plan are very important for your business. Um, you know, some expenses you may have to pay in advance, things like insurance, if you're going to a trade show, you know, other rent, first month's and last month's rent uh, are examples of prepaid expenses. Fixed assets, equipment that you're going to use in the business expensed over time. Um, and some businesses can be very capital intensive. I don't know if we have any clean tech businesses in the audience, but certainly some of the plants to deploy some of the new technologies, you know, can be quite expensive to scale on a worldwide basis. Liabilities and equity increase means a source of cash. So if you don't pay your suppliers, um, then clearly you know, you're, you're not parting with your cash. So um, clearly you have to negotiate terms that are fair to both parties. Um, but oftentimes you know, they, there is flexibility to negotiate, um, particularly with perhaps a partner who wants to get in, involved with you and sees the opportunity in your business around your inventory build or some expansion plans you might have. Um, other examples of liabilities include things like leases, your sales tax that you're going to collect from your customers, those types of things. Debt financing, um, clearly a bank loan, oftentimes in an early stage business unfortunately comes along with a personal guarantee from you, the owner of the business, so generally not that attractive. Here in Canada, we do have a small business loan for equipment, up to $250,000. It's offered through your, your Schedule A banks, so the RBCs and the TDs of the world. Um, and it is backed by uh, the Canadian government. And so it, it is something that they will enter into with a, an earlier stage company, of course, with the equipment secured as uh, the collateral for the loan. Venture debt is something that's usually only available to companies who have raised venture capital funding. Um, and they generally like to ensure that the company's a little closer to you know, hitting break even from a sales perspective before they would consider that for you. An operating line of credit usually can be secured against receivables and sometimes against inventory. They generally like to see though that you have a track record of selling. So, um, going to them with your first sale and saying, here, I have $100,000 of sale. Could you give me an operating line to lend me the money till that comes in? They likely aren't going to accept that. They're likely going to want to see you having sold product regularly for a 12 or perhaps even an 18-month period in the current market conditions. And then for those capital-intensive businesses, there obviously are sources of long-term equipment financing. Equity financing, which you know, obviously m many of us are, are familiar with, is, is clearly the proceeds from selling either common or preferred shares in your business. And some final thoughts for you. Your business or execution plan is actually quantified in your financial plan. So those assumptions and the content really have to be consistent. The key aspects of the plan, they need to be researched. You need to think them through before you start to you know, develop your financial plan. There's nothing wrong with it being a work in progress. Certainly not all elements of the plan need to be fully baked before you can talk to an investor or, or within your team to make it a useful tool. Um, you know, be honest about where you have a high degree of confidence. So if I'm really confident that you know, these R&D expenses for my team are gonna be what it's take to, to build the product, but maybe I need some help in understanding the market and how I'm gonna price my product, I need to get through customer discussions before I can make those final tweaks to my plan, that's totally acceptable uh, to an to, you know, experienced investor who may actually be able to help you based on some other experiences they've had with companies. You know, monitoring your progress against the plan is absolutely as important as developing the plan in the first place. And clearly in today's economic times, it is so important to develop a plan that generates early sales and cash flow. Um, so, you know, we would, we would really recommend that, you know, you try to be in a revenue generating position with your business within a year. Um, or sh shorter, depending on your, your ability to self-fund your, your endeavor. I wanted to also point out a few references for you on the MARS website. 
Um, so the entrepreneurial toolkit has a few articles that I've, I've outlined there that talk about how to develop a financing roadmap, what's an execution plan, how to determine what size your investment round should be, what tools you need to raise money, business plan, and particularly business plans for social enterprises and social purpose businesses. There's also a workbook that goes along, um, which is called, I think, Developing Your Financing Strategy that might be useful for any of you that are, are working on that exercise. And with that, I'll close and uh, open the floor to any questions you might have. Hi. Uh, in terms of uh, accounting for currency fluctuations, do you usually advise companies to make a conservative kind of estimation or just to lock, in, lock themselves into a futures contract? I'm sorry, could you say that again? The first For the part? currency fluctuations, do you usually advise companies to lock themselves into a futures contract or to just kind of estimate 92 cents and let's go with that if it's really conservative? What I generally tell people is if you receive funding and, and say you receive cash in either US or Canadian dollars, is I would look at, so say that funding you received is for a 12 to 18 month period that you've got in your business, I would create a natural hedge, would be for small companies generally what I'd advise them to do. So if I receive a million dollars today, Canadian, and I know I'm gonna have expenses in the next 12 months of that million dollars of 200,000, I would probably convert 200,000 and just hold the currencies and fix my rate at that date rather than play in the contracts market. Um, well, say that you, you want to sell to both markets, so the US and Canada, that's, or that you're buying in, in US and. Yeah, and so I would do it based on my, I would just base my, um, the amount of cash I was holding in either currency based on both my sales projections in that market and my, um, expen my projected expenses in that market and try to match them that way because I, I, unless you're a larger business that can afford to lose money on the contracts, which, which I have had happen in one of the larger businesses I was the CFO in, um, it can be a very difficult thing to explain to your investors that you, you, you played the wrong you know, thing and all of a sudden half a million dollars of their one or two million dollar investment went to a loss on currency. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, I talked about obviously the labor costs throughout, but it's, it's true, like laying out your headcount plan and how many people you, you see sort of in each of the, what I call the three main categories. So, you know, how many people are sort of in the tech product development or service development side, how many people are in the sales and marketing side, and how many people are in the sort of the general and administrative category. Um, and, you know, what skills those people need, what salary levels, and if they're sales and marketing people, what variable compensation. Um, as we like to say, they're coin-operated generally, so um, there's, you know, a, a piece, you know, of their compensation that you really want to incent them to do well and sell more, um, and so you, you clearly want to plan for that. <laughs> In the case of a social purpose enterprise, do you have um, uh, tools to monitor or to evaluate the social return on investment? It's a good question, and it's, it's a very difficult question to obviously you know, quantify the, the social benefits, so the social return on investments. So we actually you know, have some work we've been doing through, uh, through SIG at Mars here with Allison's group to try and come up with some, some practical um, ways that we might help entrepreneurs do that. Um, but today, I think the social return on investment piece you know, was adopted, and interestingly enough, the group that actually wrote how to do it abandoned it over time because they felt that um, trying to still bring everything back to a number that particularly complex, uh, you know, uh, sorry, plans aimed at solving complex social or environmental problems um, were not getting the same kind of um, weighting as things that were simpler and that could, you know, you could easily quantify. And so it's still an area where there's a lot of work to be done, but uh, certainly uh, I know Allison, sorry? Start, yeah, Allison's got a good tip. Start with job creation. You know, how many jobs your, you know, your business is going to create um, and, and, and try to quantify that as, as a good starting point. Thank you. Carrie, you've had lots of experience of um, 
um, building companies from the very, very early stages. Do you have any practical tips for how to bring the right caliber of financial expertise into a team that might initially be quite heavily weighted uh, towards the technology side? Are there any part-time or uh, other models that you've seen that work particularly well and particularly can get you the right credibility when you talk to investors? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I, I mean, Tony kind of alluded to a little bit in that, you know, as a finance person, you know, you need to understand, you know, the inputs and the outputs and a little bit about the technology. But the nice thing about that is, is that the person in those roles often can move across industries. So there is a really good, healthy industry of people who are, you know, part-time controllers, part-time CFOs um, that are out there. And we see that model quite effectively in companies. So Seawell Networks, which is a Mars client, and um, who I serve as the part-time CFO currently um, at, you know, has adopted that model. And we've actually done it for HR as well, and it's worked really effectively. We have an HR person, um, interestingly enough, we're in Mississauga. She's in Ottawa. She's someone we've worked with in the past and have had good experience with. And she, she does that one day a week for us, but it really makes us look like we're a much bigger, more professional organization having her outreach as we're trying to attract board members and senior people, in, particularly in the U.S. market. Um, as well as, you know, myself helping raise money for, for our business with, with the experience I have. And so, um, you know, clearly that model has worked very effectively for many companies, you know, right across the province um, for getting the financial help you need. Quick question about uh, market forecasting. Uh, do you have some tips as far as how to make something accurate to really carve your niche um, and get proper numbers and forecasting? I, th I think it's really trying to understand what your product is and how it fits into the rest of the competitive landscape and I'm sure you must cover that probably in Peter's lecture right, right. and so I think if, if you really take a look at you know the product and how it stands up against everything else it will let you then you know really understand who you know in that you know customer right, map how you predict like the percentage of the market that you're gonna actually get right that's like the concern that I have well, I, I, that's what I'm saying is if you pick the niche, so if you go and you say, okay, you know, I'm targeting women that are over 50, da 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 da, and I think those are people are going to mostly buy my product. If you think you really have a good product, I go boldly and say I'm going to get 10, 15, 20 percent of the market, and I develop a plan that's realistic. So I would want to make sure that you know I would have enough marketing dollars to target those women and understand what it costs to advertise maybe in the in the magazines or the you know online vehicles and I'd have enough salespeople to support the number I was putting forth but I, I would definitely be bold to say once you've figured out that smaller segment that you know hey I'm good I've got a great idea I'm an optimistic entrepreneur I'm gonna go you know rock their world and get the share okay great thanks <laughs> sometimes uh um, you want to build a company to have it taken over by someone else and you go ahead with, uh, how do you do the financial planning if you really think in the end you're, you're going to have to sell to the big guys, but um, up to the, if in order to reach that point, um, is, is there going to be a different strategy for financial planning? I don't really think so. And, and my advice generally to companies is, is if a merger comes along, that's great. But you should really try to build a business that you think you can operate as a standalone business. You're very much right in that the likelihood is that someone, you know, you get traction, you know, you're developing, you know, something interesting, you start to hurt the big guy and he's going to come calling. But you, you still want to build that same plan because you want to show him or her that plan when they come in um, that, you know, you were thinking big. And so when they come in and they, you know, maybe do their due diligence, they see that this was your plan. Now, your plan might realistically, though, in those circumstances, include very early on that you're going to partner. So oftentimes how mergers and acquisitions happen later, you know, is to have a, you know, a, an OEM or a distribution or a sale, selling agreement with a partner early on. So um, you would build that into your financial model. So you would right away be showing perhaps that you're going to have a lower top line, um, but, you know, more volume because you're going to have a partner who you're going to be giving some of your margin points to. And so that would probably be the only difference. But as I say, I would tend to create the plan around the business opportunity as, as opposed to thinking about the exit. Hi, uh, I liked your speech. Uh, I mean, it was a great uh, panel today. Um, I just wanted, my, I have a question is related to, um, like gen generally speaking, like you're teaching us 
about how to take um, an idea into a business. Um, so right. uh, how does Mars, how, can, I, can I come to you later on or does Mars have like some networks or like workshops where I can come and you know, show you my ideas and like have everything listed down and we can take it into a real business plan and, you know, and then take it out to venture caps or something like that? Is that, Tony, is that do you available? want to take that or? Yeah, just see Tony and uh, he can certainly make that happen. So, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, absolutely. Those are the advisory services that are offered through Mars. Okay. That's, that's Mars's core business, is providing advisory services to entrepreneurs uh, one on one and sometimes one on many. Like this. This that's right. Carrie, maybe a, a, a comment from your experience for these small companies that are always trying to punch above their weight and they're preparing this financial plan and they want to try and show some authenticity around this plan and credibility to it. Maybe some of your experience with respect to that small company going out and spending some, some of their hard money with a big name accounting firm uh, with respect to financial statement authentic authentication. And then also maybe a couple of comments around Export Development Canada, EDC, and how they can also help out with some of that receivable and cash flow stuff. Sure. So I'll talk about both of those. I, I, I can't believe we're filming this and I'm going to say this, but I am a CA and I'm going to say that as an early stage company, I wouldn't recommend that you necessarily run out and, and spend a lot of money getting your financial statements um, authenticated and audited. And generally in the early days, there's costs. And then it gets complicated when you get into earning revenue. And so I think there's a point where you would like to get some advice early on about that, because particularly in certain technology businesses like software businesses, there's some very unusual rules that my colleagues in the accounting profession have dreamed up um, that can trip you up a little bit if you get into an early um, discussion on a merger or if you're going to you know, get investors and, and understanding just what your revenue recognition policy and some things are around. And so I, my rule is while it's simple, keep it simple. Um, and then, you know, generally speaking, if you are growing a bit larger and you have some investment, then they'll, they'll you know, enforce the discipline on you and, and, and obviously, you know, bring in the people at that point in time to, um, to do the audit uh, of the business. And I think at that point, you know, you're generally, you just never know. In, in one of the Premaxis companies that Tony and I worked with, we did a Series B financing. The company had less than a million dollars in revenue, and we had a strategic investor join the round, Siemens Venture Capital Fund. And they decided, once they saw this and they understood it a bit more, within six weeks, they made an offer to acquire the company. And within less than six months, had we had negotiated an offer. And it's challenging if you don't have your audit firm and professional firm in place. And we did have one, but it was still a bit challenging because it was our first year of revenue. So we, in the end, actually just decided to recognize no revenue because it would have cost so much more and would have delayed the merger to have gone through the whole process. So, so it's kind of a hard balance to, to kind of know exactly when, um, but you want to be somewhat ready that someone might come along and make you an interesting offer for investment or acquisition at any point in time. EDC is a great point, and Lance actually actually uh, was a CEO of a company in Ottawa that, that took advantage of this financing. Um, Export Development Corporation obviously helps you finance um, taking your business global. And so if, if you are looking at you know, an interesting customer opportunity in China or India or other emerging markets where you may not understand how all of that works, you know, they're a great resource and, and, and source of both advice as well as financing vehicles that could help you expand your business on a global basis. So I don't know, Lance, if you want to add anything else on that, but sure. Hi. I recently acquired a, a couple of equity partners uh, into my business. One who is actually um, providing funds into the business for equity tra traditionally, and one who has more of like a expertise and is offering his time. Yep as equity, and I wondered if you had any pointers on how to quantify that in a business plan. Sure, um, and, and actually there is an article out on the Entrepreneur's um, Toolkit on Mars that talks about that subject as well. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but if you search on the website, I'm sure you'll find it. And it's kind of how you bring talent in earlier before you potentially could afford it. Um, and, and you can do that through stock options or, as you say, just you know having someone participate from an equity perspective. I think. 
you know, the challenge always is, as an early stage company, when your valuation is relatively low, ensuring that, you know, just for a small amount of service, you're not giving away, you know, most of your company um, to an expert. So, you know, you, they need, you need to factor in both the upside potential of those shares rather than just the pure dollar for dollar. So say your business, someone values it at $200,000 today and someone's gonna come in and be a CEO for you for a year and their old salary used to be $200,000. It really wouldn't make sense to give them 100% of your company. Because you know, you're doing work, other people are doing work, et cetera. And so it's, it's, it is a bit of finding the balance, um, you know, finding the right people who understand you know, what the upside potential is and those people that are keen to join your team because they really like the idea, passionate, have good contacts, think they can really take the business far, are the ones who are going to give you a better deal and say, you know, hey, I understand this is early. I'm going to do this you know, maybe part time and, and add my credibility to this and I'm willing to take, you know, X percent of the company for that. Um, and so we, we do have a few little more specific things around stock options for types of positions and things like that that are on that, um, on that article that might also be helpful just to give you some ideas. Hi there, I had a question about, um, given a, a budget for, say, software development over, say, a three-year period, any tips or suggestions around how to manage um, the, the budget in terms of spreading it over to account for iterate, iterative development, whether you front load in the beginning and then trail it off towards the end or something to that effect? I think my, my general feeling is, is most companies that are staying competitive in a, in a software business are generally at iterating their product. And so, yes, you, and you may use a few contractors in the beginning because you do have a real push to get that first product out, but it, it, it's generally an, a, a number that kind of stays the same or even grows a little bit over time because you could be sustaining a number of different products or features, adding things, et cetera. So I would say generally it, it, you know, it, it is going up over time, particularly as your sales are going up because you, you know, clearly you need to iterate to stay competitive in, in any marketplace in, in a technology business. Hello. Uh, could you comment about uh, valuation uh, and projecting uh, with respect to um, intellectual property such as a patent? Sorry, could you just repeat could that one? Could you comment about uh, the uh, impact or the uh, implication of a, a patent, uh, patents in a financial plan in terms of uh, valuation and how that can be figured into the scenario? Uh, into the valuation? Scenario? I think it really depends somewhat on the types of patents because there, there are patents that you know are core to a business and they could perhaps be valued on their own as a licensing stream and there are certain you know types of firms and investors that you know would gravitate towards that generally speaking I find most technology businesses patents you know are a nice way to set a few things to have some negotiations with people down the road because you know generally other people will find ways to come up with a solution for a customer that may not infringe directly on on your piece and so I encourage people to at least lay down one or two core patents you know as as a way to protect their business, um, but not necessarily to totally rely on it. So there really isn't, I would say, you know, a valuation necessarily put on the patent. I mean, you know, someone will appreciate the fact that, you know, there are, you know, unique claims that someone has issued a patent on and maybe give that a bit more value than someone who hasn't got to that stage yet. Um, but it's not, it's really more the potential of the idea that the investor is looking at from an evaluation perspective. How much revenue and bottom line can that idea and that patent generate for that business down the road? Um, hi, I was wondering how the income of the partners is determined. I don't suppose it's salaries. So do they share amongst themselves whatever they don't reinvest in the business or is it determined in the shareholder agreement? Or? It really depends. So in a pure partnership, which is, is different than a corporate structure, normally it would be on account of the partnership. So however the original partnership was set up, so if one person put in $100 and one put in $200, one would get one third and the other would get two thirds typically of the partnership income. Um, when you bring in outside investors and you have a shareholders agreement, it will determine you know, what the split is. And so you know, in most venture capital backed companies, they have a structure which introduces something called a preferred share. And a preferred share sometimes gets more than its fair share of 
the profits of the business on the exit of the business ultimately. Okay. And does it get complicated if they're investing time and expertise in the beginning instead of capital? So if some people brought the idea, for example, yeah, and actually, as I say, that article that I was mentioning does talk a little bit about that. And so one thing I recommend to teams, so say there might be a, a, a young team that comes to me that's got five or six people on it. And oftentimes, you know, we, we're Canadian, so we think, oh, we're just going to divide it by five or six um, and split the original founder shares, you know, based on us. But if you have one person who is actually doing the lion's share of the work, or one person whose role is going to be more significant, maybe as the CEO has you know, the contacts, the Rolodex of customers they're going to bring in, you really should be looking at that initial equity split based on you know, the value that that person is going to bring to the organization when you're, when you're setting up your business. And if that changes over time, so maybe someone is full-time and they decide for other reasons to go back, there's nothing wrong with also altering over time um, you know, a structure. Um, that reflects, you know, obviously, fairly what everyone's contributing to a business. Okay, I'm sure there's some one-on-ones. Would you join me in thanking? Thank you.